All right, folks, welcome in to another great episode of I've Got a Theory. I've got returning guest Andrew Lorario on our show, science teacher and science buff. Uh, welcome on. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, so I guess to start off by saying thanks to uh, Manscaped for being a sponsor for the show and providing some cool swag and, uh, and you know, helping men's grooming uh, for men's parts. I got a little bit of the reviver here. I thought I'd give it a sniff and see how it goes. The directions are to, uh, for an anytime pick-me-up, spritz your goods once or twice, and then let air dry. Yeah, that's nice. It's kind of like a subtle cologne type smell, you know, maybe like a David off type smell. So yeah, I could see how people would, would want to do that, I suppose, in, in those areas. <laughs> well, so, fresh, you know? Yeah, I don't know. You know, uh, it, it, it's, it's a popular product. It's surprising how many of my past guests are like, oh yeah, we've already got this Manscaped stuff. We love it. I'm like, oh cool. I don't even have to sell you, you one. I have some friends that have used it and then, you know, only positive things they've said about it. You know, I'm, I'm so it's good yeah, to yeah. think that people are considering, you know, the, that type of stuff. It's nice to know. So, uh, so we kind of shifted gears on this, on this uh, podcast because originally we were going to talk about anti-gravity, which we'll talk about in a future episode. And that kind of came up because I was watching specials on how the Concorde fizzled out and how extremely inefficient those engines were to be able to be supersonic speeds. Um, so I was thinking about how so I'll, I'll get into the anti-gravity stuff later. But today, we want to talk about vaccines and coronavirus vaccines. And, uh, you know, I guess the theory is the decision process of whether people should get it or not get it. Right? And that's kind of that's what we're talking about. And so let's, 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 chat, let's wrap a little bit about that in terms of you, you just had the opportunity to get the Johnson & Johnson vaccine and you were about to get it, then you changed your mind. So yeah, tell well, me about it was that. About, um, a colleague of mine had been involved with the study, and it's a double blind study, so which means that. You half don't know the if you're getting it or not. Yeah, half the participants get a placebo, half the participants get the vaccine. And the researchers don't and know course, either. No, they don't know either. But I mean, right. you know if you get the vaccine, because one of the things that went into consideration that had me shift my mind was. Uh, and I think this is true for all the vaccines, is that there's, there's some side effects you got to deal with for the, the first few days that are very common with getting them. Um, you know, you can have some uh, uh, headaches and feel nauseous and body aches, like symptoms similar to getting, you know, the, the coronavirus itself. But oh, right. the flu, yeah. it's not at the, just not, of course, at the level it is and not to the extreme. Hopefully you don't then have to intubate you because you got the vaccine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like taking me to the hospital. I need to be hospitalized. I, I tried to protect myself. Uh, the, um, Hopefully, we just don't know yet, you know, because they've done some trials, right? So we don't know how those people are feeling, but apparently, you know, 90, 95% success rate for a vaccine is an absurdly high number to be, to be stating, right? A lot yeah. of vaccines are much, much less effective, and we totally take them as, as law as you've got to take this vaccine, even though it's only 55% effective. Yeah, I work at a school and I know that there's like laws considering like they're considering legislation now of whether or not to allow people to go to school if they've been vaccinated or not. So, I mean, those, those are all decisions that I think, you know, we're going to be facing in the next couple months, you know, as, as a public. And so, so sorry, I cut you off because you were talking to me about why you didn't get the vaccine when you were offered the opportunity to be part of this, this trial. Yeah, well, a colleague of mine had it, and she was wearing a shirt that said, I'm in the antibody club. And I'm like, well, what's that all about? You know, and, it, you know, the questions led to, you know, the, the story of how she got involved with this Johnson & Johnson uh, trials that are taking place here in San Diego. And, you know, I talked to one of the representatives, and she signed me up, and it was really quick. And I was like, okay. Um, you know, and then I started looking into more of the vaccines, and I just started kind of learning more about it. And, you know, over the course of, you know, this time, what are we, nine months in now or so? Into, yeah, a long time. Uh I haven't, you know, I feel like I've been doing what I've been doing has been effective. I haven't gotten it. And I feel like, you know, when the vaccines come out, which they're about to do, even the Johnson and Johnson vaccine is at the verge of being released before the year ends. You know, it'll be a couple months until it rolls out anyway. So I figure I can wait until it's a little bit more tried and true. You know, I don't have to kind of push anything or force anything at this point. Um, and, you know, there was 
there was the reason why Johnson and Johnson hadn't moved forward was there was one uh, in the early trials there was one incidence of something that had happened where they couldn't rule out whether or not it was the vaccine that had caused it. Uh, the chances were unlikely, but they still couldn't rule it out. And I'm not at a point in my life where I need to take those chances. And it's not going to really affect my lifestyle because everyone around me wouldn't have the vaccine. So, you know, I just figured it. So based on, so Andrew, based on your personal health and, and personal uh, medical history, would you be concerned that if you got it, that you could potentially have bad side effects or could, could it also possibly be that you'd have such minimal or no side effects that you might not even notice that you had it? Or the third be- option is, is there a certain subset of people that ch- sometimes just don't contract XYZ diseases, right? I mean, a flu comes through, it doesn't seem 100% of people in, in a certain area get it, right? Maybe 50 or 25% get it, and some just don't, don't contract it for some reason. There's so many conditions. You know, the spread rate is, uh, it's determined upon like, you know, the conditions in the air, the atmosphere, the exchange rate, whether or not your body is predisposed to, uh, you know, I think there's some studies now that are looking at whether or not if you've had the flu, if whether that develops some sort of antibody response to uh, the coronavirus. You know, I know there's a particular spike on the protein that they're targeting when they give you the vaccine so that your body recognizes that spike. But I think there's other uh, um, instances where people are, are studying whether or not you've contracted something else that has made you, your body, you know, more likely to identify that spike and, and react to it, you know, which means that you wouldn't be symptomatic. You would just be okay. You know, it's still relatively new. They're studying it. They're still so. studying and there's still so many questions about it. And so it, it is seemingly a little um, worrisome to be a part of a trial when, especially if you're already going into it pretty healthy, if you've already gone through nine months of coronavirus and you didn't get sick, you're like, well, do you really want to test your chances with an unproven technology or, you know, unproven medicine just yet? Or, or do you let the frontline people that are being forced to take it, you know, and hopefully there's no martyrs amongst them yeah. uh, have to, t- have to take it and figure out what happens, you know, hopefully there's no side effects, but if there is, you know, we can kind of head it off and, and they, they'd ideally get the best medical treatment since they are frontline. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that, that's the idea that that's what went into it. You know, I'm, I'm pretty familiar with the whole clinical trial process. Um, you know, my wife works, works in uh, biotech and uh, you know, she's involved with clinical trials. She, she manages that with companies. So she knows about it. And, and I know that, you know, by the time you're in clinical three trials, it's, it, you're pretty safe in terms of anything that might go wrong. But at the same time, it's like you said, why even, why even like, you know, make that decision right now when I'm, I'm feeling healthy, you know, everything's kind of going as it is. I'm not going to be putting myself in any particular risk moving forward. Now, that being said, like there is a, like, I am a teacher. So there's, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of arrangements being made right now to bring students back to school. Understandably, you know, it, it definitely is a, a better situation for, for kids to be in a learning environment that I believe is in school. Um, now, that being said, I also understand that you definitely don't want to contribute to the spread of viruses. You definitely don't want to put any families or the communities that schools serve in, in harm's way by making these decisions. So, you know, the health of the, the children and, you know, the families they might be exposed to has to come first. But um, I do know that, that there, that's going to be a slow rolling out process where they are slowly bringing back students in and um, adjusting to more of this blended model learning before they come back and we find any kind of more permanent situation where, you know, you get into that efficacy rate that you were talking about, you know, where you get enough people vaccinated where the spread of the disease is um, mitigated to a point where it's relatively safe to be back in public and back to a sense of normalcy. Yeah. So, you know, along those same lines, uh, I mentioned I was grocery shopping last week and I heard over the announcements that Ralph's pharmacy and maybe most pharmacies are offering this now an antibody test for 25 bucks, 15 minute results. That'll tell you not if you just recently had it, right. Cause you had, wouldn't have had time to have antibodies, but potentially with 95% um, accuracy, they're saying that within the nine last nine ten months, if you had it, it would it would detect whether you had w- one of two antibodies that had been generated by your body. That, that, to me, that's worth knowing. I mean, that's, that's worth knowing. Yeah, I th- because you know, then it, that's more information. It, it gives you insight into like what are the things that I've been doing, and has that given me exposure or not? Like it tells us more about it, you know. So I think, and you know, on a personal level and on a, a larger level. 
you, you get a better sense of what, what this disease is like, you know, what this virus is like. So uh, with the vaccines, you know, there are, you, you don't hear it too often, right? And, and, it's, mm-hmm. and it may be the tang- entanglement between pharmaceutical companies and, and media and or politics. But I, I know I just recently finished an article in National Geographic, my kind of go-to source on all things science and nature, uh, about massive lawsuits against like a, a European-based pharmaceutical company that came out with a vaccine for dengue fever, right? Spread by mosquitoes. Um, Mm -hmm. And they were uh, giving it to people in the Philippines and in Indonesia and Southeast Asia and all those areas. And all of a sudden there was a massive lawsuit against them because kids that were given this vaccine were getting really bad um, side effects. In fact, even death was was involved. And so uh, there was a lot of information, a lot of disinformation, a lot of confusion. uh, But there was also a lot of just kind of hysteria that went along with this. And so was it actually the vaccine? Was it in certain circumstances? And they found it, it was like in certain circumstances, like if you had a version of it um, and then you took the vaccine and then, and, then, and then you had some symptoms, then it could cause problems versus other you know, pre-existing conditions that had differently. So it's, it's so convoluted and complicated that it's hard to uh, have trials to uncover all the variables. Right. Yeah. For, for the yeah, dengue exactly. vaccine or for coronavirus, like you know, one of my best friends that I'm hanging out with this weekend, he's definitely afraid of coronavirus, partly because he's got pre-existing conditions, including diabetes, including respiratory issues. So he's mm-hmm. saying, "Shoot, you know, I'm a double whammy for this thing." And yeah. then, as he puts it, you know, COVID business is booming, right? It's out there, and if he gets it, he's been hospitalized multiple times in the last couple of years for respiratory issues, and if it affects his respiratory issues. Uh, and, and now he's got a double whammy. He's, he's you know, he's probably going to be intubated. Yeah. Now, if I was someone like him, I would, I would go take the vaccine. I would do what I could to try to prevent getting the disease. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Not, not only is he going and taking the vaccine, he's buying stock in all these vaccine companies. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Johnson and Johnson's the one I was just involved in. Oh, and so the delivery method is something there. Like, is it one shot? Is it two shots? Does it have to be stored at a certain? Can it be? Uh, can it be administered through typical? Um, avenues that that vaccines are do you have to create a whole new system for it you know so these are things so yeah that could go into your investing kind of like you know uh, yeah that's what he was saying so you know the one that he liked didn't have to be stored at negative 170 degrees fahrenheit mm-hmm. right which is a hard thing for most people that yeah. don't have i think i think the moderna one needed that oh exactly. the, no the pfizer one did the pfizer one needed the moderna didn't need it the moderna didn't and then the there's the astrazeneca one that came out and I believe that one was more effective for older populations. Wow. And now the Johnson and Johnson one's coming out. And I think that's, that's, that can be stored at normal temperatures and typical vaccine temperatures. And it's a one shot thing. So it's not a two shot thing, which, you know, so all these little delivery methods, I think have an impact on whether or not, which one becomes the top dog, I guess, you know, like <laughs> which one are people going to take, you know, and, um, and, and, and obviously our families know each other, but yeah, my wife, was joking. It's like, ah, this is going to come out in five or 10 years. And all of a sudden people are going to have random uh, side effects. Like all of a sudden they can't get pregnant or, or, you know, they have some kind of heart murmur and then they may or may not attribute it to a vaccine. And who knows, you know, you, you just don't know un- until you, don't. You, do, you do these studies and then it's long-term because they haven't had time for long-term effects. Like what is it exactly doing? Because I feel like they share the science, but just the good parts. They don't tell you Oh, by the way, it could deteriorate your bones, or you well, know, you could I, have hearing loss or internal bleeding. Right? It's like all the disclaimers <laughs> they say when oh, they say it really fast wrong. when you watch the, the news, you're like, uh, ask your doctor <laughs> about this drug. By the way, your eyeballs could be bleeding as a result of this. I'm like, why, 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 why would I take a drug that causes eyeball bleeding? Like, I don't answer, need that. They have it. Um, you know what I think you said earlier kind of captures. I don't think they're necessarily withholding information. Yeah, I think like like they're being like you know all like you know cynical or not cynical they're all being you know like nefarious purposes here <laughs> like we're gonna make money yeah uh, I, th- I think it's more about kind of what you said earlier where you know the populations of people that are involved in the clinical trials might not be entirely representative of all the people that will be getting the vaccine right you, know? you, you uh, can't you can't uh, qualify for every pre-existing condition or every circumstance that people have because everyone's unique yeah and and in order to study these vaccines well you have to have a certain number of populations of people within the trials that actually do contract the actual virus. So you have to wait until you hit that number too. Um, you know, when you go back to the dengue fever thing, 
were they actually using the populations of people that, that they were administering it to? Because there might have been some environmental factor. There might have been some like um, genetic predisposition to a, an immune response to the virus. You know, and I think that's one of the number one risks when you get a vaccine is that perhaps you have some genetic predisposition to an 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 immune response that causes some other issues. So then you have an autoimmune kind of issue that you're dealing with, which might come into play, you know, and I think those are some of the more uh, real significant issues with getting a vaccine. Is there something within your genetic predisposition that would cause you to have an immune response that causes negative symptoms or side effects that you have to deal with after getting the vaccine, you know? And I know that's a very, very small number of people that have that, but that does exist at times. Yeah. And so now, now the equation is, for my classification, for my category of person, health, pre-existing conditions, are the odds of me getting coronavirus and getting sick from it and the consequences of that better or worse than the odds of me taking the vaccine and having some side effects that are still unknown, right? And that's the calculation that I'm making, right? This is kind of the risk factor analysis that you make when you're looking at something like, hey, my two options are take it or don't take it. And what are the consequences of each? And that's got to be on some kind of sliding scale of, uh, of predictability of, of what could happen, right? And that's kind of the same, same calculation you did when you decided maybe I don't want to be in this first round of trials or maybe third round of trials yeah, yeah. as it may be Similar. because because you still don't know because factually you could get coronavirus and the symptoms might be so mild like, ah, that wasn't so bad. I'm glad I didn't take this vaccine with unknown consequences that they haven't studied on every set of the population yet. Yeah. But, but then again, I mean, I, I think what you said is valid, and that, that is the consideration, I believe. Uh, but when it comes to the vaccines, ultimately getting the virus or getting the vaccine leads to the same outcome where you have the antibodies. Right. Um, is, is it, and, you think those are similarly effective? Because, I, you know, for example, the flu shot is prime example. Any given year, they're changing the flu formula to, to counteract or prevent the various strains of flu that they predict might be coming out. But for yeah, a lot of estimates, it's only the, like 25% effective. Yeah, they're looking at the waves because it mutates. It mutates a lot. For and, sure. and then that's where, that's where that efficacy number comes into a huge play here. Because if you, if you get a large enough portion, and this is, the, this is the conundrum, this is the problem. When you get a vaccine that's highly effective, it's not just having that efficacy rate that's really high. You have to have a large enough portion of the population that takes that vaccine that gets the population to a point where the spread is not going to happen anymore because there's enough people immune to it. And that spread then stops its ability to mutate. So with the flu, it just keeps circulating and mutating and circulating and mutating. So there's really no way to stop it, you know, because it, it, it just keeps, it's so widespread. It's, it's evolving and, quicker yeah, than we yeah, can make medicines for going, you know? Versus there are some medicines and, and, and vaccines and viruses that we've effectively eradicated right yeah. mumps measles rubella smallpox oh, yeah. polio these things that were disastrous in prior years to people now aren't aren't even a concern of ours anymore yeah and and because and i i'm not i don't i can't speak entirely to it but i know with polio i believe the efficacy rate of the polio was in the upper 80s 90 percent. so it was reaching that same efficacy level um now it, it's in, in creating a, a, a response, an immune response to create the antibodies. You know, so th that's what's really promising about these vaccines. It seems like they're, they're highly, highly effective in creating the antibodies. So, yeah. And so in, in polio, obviously no one wants to get polio because next thing you know, you've got, you know, like, uh, you know, frozen legs and bones and, and, and life altering diseases. It, it's just a tough thing. So it's the same thing with flu vaccine. Like, you know, they always recommend you take the flu vaccine, but a lot of people don't take it, you know, myself included, because I know when I get the flu, it barely affects me, you know, like yeah. oh, I might have a fever for a day or two and then I'm back out, you know, running a hundred miles an hour. Um, and so I, I think that that's, that's the tough thing. You can't say universally blanket like this XYZ, uh, you know, uh, vaccine is for everyone versus some of these things like the MMR and, you know, and polio and smallpox. Like we've just universally accepted, hey, everyone's got to get these as kids because we've just proven it works. And then, you know, the, the anti-vaxxer communities that don't take it, then they get these random outbreaks. You're like, why are you bringing back smallpox in your community and random, yeah. you know, in a random Missouri town because you just don't believe in vaccines because of. And, and at one time with each of those diseases, there was the mass distribution and people getting that vaccine. 
So there was that event, you know, that event had to happen. So that's what we're facing right now. And the question, I mean, I think there's different considerations. One is on an individual level. Yeah, we can look at like, you know, and for me, this is the way I'm looking at it. You know, how does this work with me individually? I'm relatively healthy. I think I'll be okay. Do I, you know, and those considerations come into my mind. You know, do I want to deal with the 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 impacts? And when you're thinking about your children, do you want them to maybe have some long term effects of something that might not be really well known? But then on the other hand, you're thinking, what is my, you know, responsibility to the larger community as a whole? If I don't take this vaccine, am I going to contribute to Spreading. The continuing spread of this virus where it might mutate into something worse and then we're going to be dealing with it forever instead of just getting it over with and getting it done with. Hmm. You know, so. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's an interesting perspective. You're right. And, and it's so hard to, to, to really understand and know. Um, I, in, I don't know, I don't know a lot of people lining up for the, the uh, vaccine just yet, you know, and in a few minutes I have to jump on a call with an, an older gentleman that's a good friend of mine. And even he, even though he's definitely afraid of it because he's in his 70s, He's he's a little nervous about taking the vaccine too until it's you know kind of proven beyond a shadow of a doubt that hey this is going to be better for me than the virus could be bad for me. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's that's and, the tough that's the tough calculation because this is now this is this is just the gamble right you're kind of semi playing Russian roulette with the vaccine or do I take get the, get it, take the odds of getting I the, lean the I lean on the side personally of getting the vaccine that's my personal thing. <laughs> you're, I, I, yeah, I'm for sure you're probably out. right the side effects for that are probably better for people that are concerned, that are older, that are obese, that have diabetes, yeah. that have these pre-existing conditions, then actually getting the disease and having a one to 5% chance of mortality, right? Yeah. And, and, and you know, it, it's the lack of information of like, what are all the different things that are working, you know, uh, systematically in your body that contribute to the immune response when you do contract the disease, as opposed to just getting introduced to the spike that your bodies respond to, right? So for example, you know, like nutritionism is an analogous situation where in Western culture, we, we look at nutrition and food and we kind of extract, you know, we process foods to extract it. And then we put back in what we think is important. They fortify it, right? Yeah, we fortify it without really knowing, well, what, what are all the other things in there and how do they play a part, right? So when you get the virus in your body, like your body's going to respond in a lot of ways and maybe in some ways that we're not aware of. So the idea of making a vaccine is the same kind of approach where we're like, well, we're going to take this one thing and put it in your body and then your body is going to be protective of this one thing. Now, I know a little bit more about that. Like I know about the proteins and the spike and the, you know, the, 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 even the, the Moderna ones using the, the messenger RNA kind of method where it's injecting a piece of DNA into your cells. So your cells kind of start producing the antibodies, you know, and I think developing all this medical technology is fascinating and awesome. And I think it's going to lead to breakthroughs in the future for whatever else we have to deal with. Um, but we're also in the developing stages of it. And, you know, for me, I, I mean, there's just, there's just so much that goes into play there, but I still will lean in the, in the direction. I think it's better to go the vaccine route and have to deal with the potential of coming up with some serious issues with getting the coronavirus. I mean, I'm still- No, for sure. You're right. And, you know, and and the spreading thing is is a real concern, you know, with with my parents being around and, you know, and and, and older people being around, you really have to be kind of concerned because, yeah, I don't want to accidentally spread it to someone and and then I'm kicking myself because, you know, I I felt that I would be okay if I got it. Yeah. I'm going to be in a classroom with students and, you know, their safety- Above all else, you know, for me as a teacher, like the safety of my students and their families is always my number one concern, you know, and I don't want to do anything to put them in harm's way. For sure, for sure. But, you know, I've heard uh, informal polls happening at the school that we're at um, with 90, 95% of parents saying, yeah, if they had in-person class again, they'd let their kids go. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is, is that what you're hearing too at your school? Well, I think, I think that's a lot of sentiment from, I, I, I think that there's nuances here you know, from different socioeconomic kind of like uh, demographics. True. And that's, uh, that's relevant because yeah, if you don't, if you can't afford to just be at home with your kid all day long, cause you got to go to work. I mean, you need to take him to school, right? You need to keep your yeah. livelihood cause that's, that affects your ability to survive as well. Mm-hmm. And, and there's, this is a longer conversation cause I've sat in the meetings where like, you know, they've had experts from the district come down and health experts talk to kind of like our school board and them sharing their decision-making and information. And you kind of get to weigh in as a teacher and give a little voice to that. And um, It's, you know, ultimately it comes down to like, we want to make the best decisions for people. Everyone's got great intents, but the impact is unknown. You know, so if we make these decisions, what happens if someone gets seriously ill? If we don't make these decisions, what happens if kids have to sit at home for another semester and, you know, we run into issues with that and, 
I mean, sure. So a, everyone's erring on the side of caution. Yeah. That's what's happening. Right. Uh, for the most part, yeah. I mean, the, because I think the consequences are so severe. Yeah. But it's not necessarily some, really some percentage of the population because there are people that are affected and there are people that are dying. And I'm not trying to sound insensitive, but um, that, yeah, we, we, we do have to care after people that, that, that need the care the most. Uh huh. I mean, even if it's down at like, you know, 1% of people, you know, that, that's, you know, I, I work at a school with, you know, thousands of people come in and out of, you know, in the whole kind of campus area. And, you know, if you make a decision to open schools back up and even one person, you know, a, a group of people get seriously ill, have to deal with long-term effects or their families and someone in their family dies, like that's, that, that's a hard thing to know that, you, you know, how do you remove yourself from taking any responsibility in that decision-making process? You know, I think that's, that's, that's a weight. It's tough. It's, it's, yeah. We're in tough times, you know, and every decision is tough. And, yeah, for sure. And, and people are trying to do it with the best information they have. And unfortunately, that information is incomplete. Yeah. That's that's how that's going down. Whew. We should end this on a positive note, man. <laughs> what, what's what about trimming your balls, maybe? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There we go. There we go. <laughs> one, one thing that has proven not to kill you is to make sure that you have your lights on when trimming your man areas. Uh huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. So that's that's and, that's the lesson from that. Despite many of us letting all of our hair go and like all of our kind of hygiene and you know trimmings go during this break. Nothing feels better than cleaning up a little bit, especially in, in you know, your sensitive areas. Yeah, for sure. So that, that's our positive note. Well, Andrew, I appreciate you joining me again for another episode uh, of I've Got a Theory. That was fun to discuss. I mean, yeah, the vaccine is a, a hairy topic, um, unlike your balls will be with this thing. But the... Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. You do that well. You like, you know, you segue. Yeah, we that one in. I, honestly, I just thought of that on the spot, but that, that works. So I'm going to have to use that in future episodes. So keep that in mind for Harry's situation. Thank you for joining. Uh, please like, subscribe, comment to our podcast. Follow us on PSTV. Um, and uh, Andrew, thanks again for joining us. We'll have to talk anti gravity sometime soon. Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to come back. Thank you for having me All again. Right. Talk soon.